Welcome to Global Action. We have put the camera on the right place. We will tape uh, this, but we will not uh, stream it. Uh, and we will put it on the Global Action's uh, YouTube channel later on. Welcome to Global Action. We are a solidarity organization working with different movements around the world on social economic rights mainly. Um, we are a volunteer organization, we are a member-based organization, and we have been working uh, with and around the issue of Western Sahara for many years now. Probably some of you have never heard much about Western Sahara. Now you have your chance. Um, because uh, Stephen Saunders has, is a guest professor at the University of Göteborg in Sweden and is now in Denmark. And uh, it means that we can, we can have his uh, input to uh, the two conflicts, <laughs> the one in Palestine and the one in the Western Sahara. Um, we have asked him to speak around 40 minutes. If you have any clarifications, please put up your hand and ask uh, what do you mean? What questions and the debate will take after a short break after his presentation? Um, we will not film the audience, uh, so we will not be in the risk of ending our YouTube. So welcome here. Uh, the toilets are just down here, uh, down there. There's coffee, tea, cold water over there. And if you want a soft drink or a beer, you can buy it in the fridge just at the okay. Yeah. So uh, welcome again to Global Action. Uh, we're looking forward to your presentation. Thank you so much. And I really do mean to thank you because um, you know, I, I've been involved pretty heavily in uh, solidarity work with both Palestine and Western Sahara for, for decades now. And I'm often asked to speak about uh, Palestine, especially in recent months. But, uh, you know, rarely do I ever get a chance to talk about Western Sahara. As well. Oh, this may be the first time I've been asked to talk about my favorite topic. And that is uh, talking about bringing them together, bringing them together. And um, so thank you for this uh, really special opportunity. Um, you know, the Hamas terrorist attack on Israel uh, this past October and the Israeli war on Gaza that followed has put much of the world's attention, of course, on Israel and Palestine, not just in regard to the tragic events of recent months, but to the Palestinian struggle for self-determination uh, against the 56-year occupation. I'm not going to address Gaza uh, in my prepared remarks, though please, I'd be quite happy to talk about it in, in, um, in, the, in the question and answer period if you, if you, if you would like. Hmm. But anyway, the, the increasing focus on the longstanding uh, Israeli-Palestinian uh, uh, conflict provides, I think, an opening for those of us who are also concerned about another UN-recognized occupation, which has been going on almost as long, for 48 years, that is of Morocco's occupation over Western Sahara. And it serves as a reminder that Israel is not the only Western-backed occupation. Um, and it gives us, and, and, and it's not the only, 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 West, only recognized occupying power. Uh, and it gives us an opportunity to emphasize the importance of upholding principles of international law everywhere. Uh, the plight of the Palestinians deserves all the attention it has been getting from those of us concerned about peace, human rights, and international law. It's disappointing, however, that the um, Western Saharans have not been getting similar attention. And ironic as well, unlike the Palestinians, the Western Saharan independence movement is united under the leadership of a single entity, Polisario Front. Not every Sahrawi agrees with every policy of the Polisario leadership, but they do recognize them as their sole legitimate representatives. They've not established any rival independence organization or anything like that. Um, the Palestinian is relatively democratic, and its leadership accountable. 
you know, there's uh, not not much in the way of corruption, and they're free uh, democratic elections held regularly for both the legislative and executive branches. And though the majority of Sahrawis, the vast majority of Sahrawis, are devout Muslims, the Palestinian Front is secular, uh, believing that matters of faith and practice should be between the individual and God. Uh, women have equal rights to inheritance and divorce. They keep their maiden names. They have positions of leadership, uh, both within the Polisario and in the nonviolent resistance movement uh, inside the occupied territory. And both the, uh, the official Polisario representatives here in Denmark and Sweden, for example, are both women. Um, the Polis, unlike some Palestinian groups, the Polisario has never engaged in terrorism and has strictly adhered to the Fourth Geneva Convention and the laws of, and the laws of war. They are fighting Moroccan occupation forces, not in, inside their country, not Moroccan civilians, including the Moroccan settlers whose presence in the occupied territory is illegal under international law. Indeed, uh, the proportionally, proportionally, there are more Moroccan settlers in occupied Western Sahara than there are Israeli settlers in the occupied West Bank, though they are both illegal according to the Fourth Geneva Convention that prohibits countries from transferring their civilian population onto territories seized by military force. The Palestara has never questioned Morocco's right to exist and has pledged to respect Morocco's strategic interests and its internationally recognized borders. Even the parts of Southern Morocco with a predominantly Sahrawi population, which Spain separated from the rest of Western Sahara late in during the colonial period. Despite all this, we have not heard demands of, from the United States or Europe, most European countries for a two-state solution, but in the conflict between Morocco and Western Sahara, as they've been calling to calling for in relation to Israel and Palestine. Even Western nations that have formerly recognized Palestine, uh, like, like Sweden, and Iceland uh, have not uh, recognized um, Western Sahara, though at one time or another, 84 countries <laughs> have recognized the Sahrawi Arab Democratic Republic, the Western Saharan state, which is a full member state of the African Union. This seems to, this, I mean, this seems to send a message to the Palestinians. Even if unify under one leadership, even if you never engage in terrorism, even if you recognize Israel's right to exist, even if you clean up your corruption, you're democratic, do everything the Western nations say you should do, we're still not going to support you. We still aren't going to stop supporting the occupation. And that's the message they're giving to the Palestinians by the pol policy towards Western Sahara. So what incentive does this offer? Both, uh, the, uh, both the Western Sahara and the West Bank are recognized as territories under foreign belligerent occupation by the United Nations. And if anything, Western, Western Saharans have an even stronger legal case for independence, uh, or so I should say self-determination. They could choose not to be independent. They, they um, it, you know, if you're not a self-governing territory, you could decide to remain part of the colonial power, like Puerto Rico has to in relation to the United States, or the, the French Caribbean islands have decided to do in regard to France. But they need to have a choice of independence, and uh, they have been denied uh, that that uh, that right. Um, and the. And they all that they've been asking, you know, ever since the early 70s, for a free and fair referendum, internationally supervised referendum. So they get to decide themselves. Morocco has refused to do that. And the, the Western nations have blocked the United Nations Security Council from enforcing its mandate you know, for an act of self-determination. Though, Huh? No, there is more Moroccan 
Yeah, yeah, but, but this, the, 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 the calls for referendum are for the, the indigenous population, not settlers, just like in the West, uh, in the of the West Bank. Though Moroccans, unlike Israelis, want people to believe that the conquered and subjugated people are the same nationality, uh, the Sahrawis, who uh, populate Western Sahara and parts of neighboring countries, do have a distinct dialect, history, kinship system, food, dress, and other cultural attributes. They were never part of Morocco, though Morocco claims they were uh, were by virtue of some pledges by some tribal leaders a couple centuries ago, pledged pledges of fealty by some tribal leaders to the Moroccan Sultan. Now, the International Court of Justice ruled that, that um, yeah, there were these pledges of fealty by some tribal leaders, but that does not constitute sovereignty. And that does not deny the people of that territory the right to self-determination like every other uh, non-self-governing territory, like every other country. And that's why uh, West Sahara is um, often referred to as Africa's last colony. Um, the, um, indeed, a broad consensus of international legal scholars recognize that, uh, the, the, that they do have, indeed, the right of self-determination. Now, the Moroccans have put forward what they call an autonomy plan, uh, where that, that for, for, after denying that the Sahrawis were any different than Moroccans, they, they now recognize, well, yeah, there are some you know, cultural and linguistic and other differences. They can have some autonomy under the uh, Moroccan crown. But if you look at the details of the uh, autonomy plan, it's a lot of it's rather vague. And it says it doesn't um, you know, contradict anything in the Moroccan constitution, including Article 19, which basically says uh, the king can decide pretty much any, anything he wants, and that's the law. And, um, and you know, Morocco, um, it is like the, um, and when, when we think about authoritarian, uh, authoritarian states that have offered autonomy to uh, various uh, to 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 uh, minority regions like um, uh, Ethiopia and Eritrea and Serbia and Kosovo. It didn't turn out too well. They revoked the autonomy. And we had these ter terrible wars, etc. And again, the, the the Moroccan states always been very centralized. I mean, it's really even hard to imagine it allowing for this kind of uh, you know, decentralization. Um, but the most important thing about the autonomy plan is it does not allow the option of independence. Again, if the people of Western Sahara freely chose autonomy, that would, that would be fine. It's their choice. But it has to be, uh, independence has to be an alternative they, that they, have, they can choose as well. It's, it's up to them. They have to have that choice. Um, so I've been asked to, to look uh, briefly at, the, the, uh, since I'm an American, to look at United States relations to both countries, uh, because the United States, of course, is such an, an important player in the international community. Starting with the uh, US and Moroccan relations, Morocco, interestingly enough, was the very first country in the world to recognize the newly independent United States back in 1777. So we go way back. Um, and uh, after independence, concern about how a number of uh, African and Arab countries were turning towards more kind of a, more of a left-leaning uh, nationalism and the imperialism. We really liked the Moroccans because they were very pro-West. I mean, the the, the uh, royal family uh, were you know big-time Francophiles. They spoke better French than they did English. Sorry, said better French than they did Arabic. You know, they were very. Um, uh, you know, very much aligned with the West during the Cold War. They were they were, they hosted uh, four U.S. military bases, major CIA uh, center. Um, they were they were enemies with the revolutionary uh, Algeria, um, and uh, they even played a surrogate for U.S. interests. Like when the United States tried to crush a uh, leftist uprising against the Mobutu dictatorship, in and uh, you know, it was then called Zaire. Uh, the, the U.S. flew in, uh, you know, 12,000 Moroccan troops to help with the suppression. They also intervened in, um, in places um, uh, like Togo, Equatorial Guinea, other places in support of U.S. interests. It was through them we funneled arms to UNITA, 
the uh, uh, the rebel movement in uh, in southern Angola, lied in white South Africa that was fighting the uh, Marxist uh, MPLA uh, government uh, there. So they they, they played by very, very much a surrogate kind of role. And since the end of the Cold War, uh, they've been an ally in the so-called war on terrorism. They are one of those black sites where um, Al Qaeda suspects would be taken for torture uh, and worse. Um, and yeah, I mean, so it's a, it's a, it's you know, they played a very, uh, very important uh, uh, role. And uh, the, um, and the United States played a major role in creating this crisis in Western Sahara in the first place. Spain, the colonial power, had planned to go ahead with a referendum, which almost everybody assumed would lead to independence. The United Nations investigative body was there in the, uh, in the summer of uh, 1975 and said virtually everywhere they met, went, went, people were wanted independence under the leadership of the Polisario. Virtually no, none of them wanted independence with Morocco or Mauritania, which had these eruditist designs on the uh, on the territory. Um, but uh, the United States, the Polisario had launched an anti-colonial war against the Spaniards just a couple of years earlier. And they were considered, they thought they're never, they're not communists. In fact, they didn't even consider themselves Marxist, but they were definitely a part of this sort of left wing, third world revolutionary, you know, um, milieu uh, that, that was uh, taking, that was popular at the time. And uh, Secretary of State Kissinger said, we cannot have another Angola on the North Atlantic, you know, and, and uh, just did, didn't want to have a leftist uh, government there. And uh, he convinced a reluctant Spain that was then preoccupied by the longtime fascist dictator, Francisco Franco, who was dying at the time, that uh, they did not, want, did not want to get in a conflict with Morocco, which was threatening to invade. And so with the promise of, uh, of uh, increasing uh, rent on American uh, military bases there and other incentives, uh, Spain you know, signed over temporary administrative power to uh, Morocco and, and, and Mauritania, which Morocco ended up using to basically annex the entire territory and seizing it by, by force, you know, forcing nearly half of the population out into uh, refugee camps in uh, Algeria, where they remain to this day. Um, and the, uh, but they kept the uh, Polisario turning their guns initially on Mauritania and defeated them and then on to Morocco. And by 1982, they liberated uh, 85% of the territory. Um, Morocco's just holding on to the tiny northwestern corner of it. But Reagan ended up sending in uh, massive amounts of U.S. aid, including U.S. special forces, uh, to train the Moroccans into more flexible counterinsurgency tactics and reversed the, uh, the, the war. So that by the time a ceasefire was, was signed in um, 1991, uh, Morocco had reconquered you know, close to 75, 80% of Western Sahara, including most of the populated areas and the resource rich uh, um, uh, parts as well. The, um, um, and uh, when, uh, when, uh, the former U.S. Secretary of State James Baker was the UN Special uh, UN Secretary General's special envoy. He came up with a plan for a two-part process of self-determination that actually would have allowed so, uh, many of the um, Moroccan settlers to vote in the second round. Uh, but despite um, many advantages to Morocco in this deal, uh, Morocco rejected it. And um, so, uh, so, so Baker had really hoped that, therefore, the Bush administration uh, would pressure uh, Morocco to, um, to go through with this, but uh, they refused. Baker resigned, uh, the, and the peace process has generally stalled ever since. That's when Morocco came up with the autonomy plan, which the Bush administration immediately endorsed and uh, signed a free trade agreement with Morocco and declare Morocco a major non-NATO ally, a coveted status which only a handful of countries like um, Israel, Australia, um, and a couple others have. So essentially, the United States was rewarding Morocco for its um, intransigence. 
And the big shock came in 2020. The Polisario had just resumed the armed struggle because it stopped the armed struggle in return for this referendum. And, uh, you know, nearly 30 years later, Morocco had refused to, to honor it. And, and they're engaging in a whole series of violations of the ceasefire and other provocations. But uh, not long after that, in December, and these are just the final six weeks of um, Trump's term in office, he decided to unilaterally recognize Morocco's annexation of Western Sahara. This is the first country that had, had, had done so, formally recognized. And um, there, uh, and this was in exchange for Morocco uh, recognizing Israel, even though Morocco had informally been dealing with Israel for many, many years. He said it was part of a peace plan so Morocco has not threatened war with Israel, I and mean, they're about uh, 2,000 kilometers from Israel. <laughs> but um, in any case, um, so there's a lot of hope that when Biden became president, since he was a fairly institutionalist kind of guy, who, and who immediately reversed uh, Trump's decision on the climate, uh, uh, pulling out of the climate, Paris Climate Agreement and other things, that he'd reverse this as, as well, uh, but he has refused. Um, and, uh, and 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 this shock has upset a lot of people, including bipartisan members of Congress, broader consensus of the academic community, uh, and uh, the vast majority of State Department veterans who were familiar with the uh, with the region. Uh, part of the fear may have been that if he had uh, uh, reversed the recognition of Morocco's annexation, um, Israel would have reversed. It's reckon, uh, Morocco would have reversed its recognition of Israel, and uh, uh, Biden would have been blamed for for hurting Israel and hurting the peace process and 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 that sort of thing. But let's remember, Biden has never been that big on international law in general. And we've seen this in the past few months uh, regarding Gaza. Um, he um, um, uh, he uh, he's you know vetoed these. Uh, three UN Security Council resolutions calling for a ceasefire, one of only 10 countries in the 193 member General Assembly to vote against the ceasefire. Uh, and, and indeed, he, he, um, uh, he, he, uh, he didn't reverse Trump's recognition of uh, Israel's illegal annexation of the Golan region of southwestern Syria, you know, which uh, um, this is in direct violation of a series of UN Security Council resolutions, which even Reagan supported. Um, indeed, the US recognition of uh, Israel's annexation of the Golan uh, was mentioned by Russia in a recent Security Council debate about uh, Ukraine. You know, because uh, Biden says, we have to defend the rules-based international order that no country can unilaterally change international boundaries, that no country can expand its territory by force. And Russia pointed out, well, he, he did this in Syria, which Israel seized by force in 1967, again, in violation of UN Security Council resolutions. But 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 uh, at, at, at least when it's go, go on, it was part of, it was a relatively small part of one country. In the case of Western Sahara, we're talking about taking over an entire nation. In fact, you have the US, U.S. recognition includes even the parts of Western Sahara that Morocco has never, ever controlled. And remember, West and, and Western Sahara as a full member state of the African Union. Here's a case where you know the United States is recognizing the forcible takeover of one recognized sovereign African nation by another. Um, and um, <clears throat> the um, and there's a. Um, and the, the, the link with Israel is, is actually uh, interesting because unlike the um, Israel lobby in the United States, pro-Israel lobby, which has a lot of grassroots support from the right wing of the American Jewish community, uh, Morocco doesn't have a domestic ethnic lobby, really to speak of. Um, they, they, they rely on professional lobbyists, you know, from these high priced uh, lobbying firms. Uh, but uh, you know, they're, that are hired directly you know, by the um, Moroccan government. But since December 2020, the Israel lobby has joined in the pro-Moroccan effort. Um, 
making making it more difficult to even to to challenge uh, administration uh, a policy. Um, the the uh, nearly fifty years of U.S. support from Morocco's occupation prior to this. Uh, demonstrates, though, that the U.S. does not need a powerful lobby to support occupations. Indeed, the United States supported Indonesia's occupation of East Timor for 24 years. Uh, the United States, along with Britain and France, vetoed a series of U.N. Security Council resolutions uh, in support uh, uh, opposed to apartheid South Africa's occupation of um, Namibia. Um, and Israel, I should mention, is the only other country to recognize Morocco's annexation of the Western Sahara. So this followed the U.S. Uh, move, uh, not, not the other way around. And Biden has not formally, the Biden administration has not formally said we endorse uh, uh, Trump's recognition. You know, their spokespeople studiously avoid even direct questions about that. But if you look at um, U.S. government maps, they all show Western Sahara as part of Morocco. No, you know, no dotted lines, no hash marks, just one solid country. We, 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 U.S. government maps do not include West, West Bank as part of Israel, or Crimea, or Donbass as part of Russia, but they do um, have the Golan Heights and Western Sahara as part of the uh, nations that invaded, occupied, and illegally connects it. And again, you won't find that on almost any other maps. Look at Apple, Google, Rand McNally, National Geographic, United Nations, Western Sahara is either a separate country or there'll be a dotted line or hash marks or something that, you know, that shows its uh, distinct um, uh, um, characteristics. Um, and, and so, and again, effectively, the Biden administration is recognizing the right of conquest, even as we talk about the rules-based international order in reference to uh, Russia and Ukraine. Um, regarding uh, U.S. and Israeli relations, um, the United States was the first country to recognize Israel, uh, but did not uh, give a lot of support for Israel in terms of military economic aid. Uh, during its first uh, 19 years of existence, France and Britain were the major supporters. But after Israel proved itself more powerful than any combination of Arab armies, that's when the aid started to, to pour in. And it's interesting. The, the you know we hear uh, we've got we got to defend Israel as you know to, as if it's a struggling democracy against the Arab hordes. You know, but you know back when Israel was most democratic and most vulnerable, there was, was hardly any U.S. aid. But the more right wing they become, more repressive they become, the more authoritarian they become, and the stronger they have come militarily relative to their neighbors, the more U.S. aid has flowed. So it's in the opposite direction of the stated uh, stated reasons. Indeed, Israel's gotten far more foreign aid than any country in history, even though Israel is small and relatively wealthy. The United States has used its veto in the UN Security Council 48 times to shield Israel from criticism. And each and every one of the, each of these 48 times, it was the only dissenting vote uh, out of the 15 member council. And both Republican and Democratic administrations have denounced the International Court of Justice, the International Criminal Court. United Nations Human Rights Council and other UN bodies, as well as Amnesty International, and Human Rights Watch, and other groups that have documented Israeli violations of international humanitarian law, insisting they are all biased against Israel, even though, as you know from all these entities, they've also been critical of quite a few other countries as well. Um, Biden says he's for a two-state solution, uh, but he is. Uh, uh, but you know, while the U.S. recognizes Palestine, uh, Israel, we refuse to recognize the state of Palestine. We said the United Nations was right to unilaterally recognize Israel back in 1947, 
but it would be wrong for them to recognize Israel. In fact, the United States says that they'll pull out of and cut funding for any UN agency that recognizes the state of Palestine. And according to U.S. law, the U.S. would cut all ties and aid to the, to the Palestine Authority if they even ask to be granted full member state uh, full member state status in in any UN agency, even though there are 138 countries around the world that do recognize vast majority of countries in the world do recognize the uh, state of um, of Palestine. And uh, the, um, <clears throat> in fact, you know, you know, uh, under Biden, we've established a full-time position in the State Department whose sole job is to get Arab countries and other countries to unilaterally recognize Israel, but not Palestine. And the, uh, um, <clears throat> Um, and the Biden administration insists that Israel should control um, at least the 78 percent of historic Palestine you know, that it that it you know, seized in the uh, War of Independence, 1947-48, but opposes that. But uh, but that Palestine has to um, that the. the uh, the, 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 the percentage of the remaining 22% that would be part of a Palestinian state, that's negotiable. And Israel should be able to, to annex large swaths of the of what's left of the West Bank <laughs> into Israel uh, if, that's, if that's what uh, they decide. But the thing is, oh yeah, I should mention that, of course, the administration provides billions of dollars in aid to the Israeli government. Um, this, uh, 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 despite the Prime Minister of Israel being very clear in his opposition to the establishment of any kind of Palestinian state. And yet, Biden has also threatened to cut off all relations, all ties to the Palestinian government, the West Bank, the Palestine Authority. They have even one cabinet member that refuses to recognize Israel's right to exist. Um, and the meanwhile, the Biden administration insists that Jerusalem multi-ethnic, multi-faith, historically Palestinian city, is the undivided capital of Israel, but not Palestine. Biden, as a senator, co-authored the bill to move the U.S. Embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, which Trump did uh, when he was president. And the U.S. is virtually the only country in the world to have it there. Meanwhile, Trump closed the U.S. mission in East Jerusalem, which had been there since the 1930s, serving the Palestinian community, and Biden has not reopened it. So just like Biden's claims that he wants to see fire and cares about civilian casualties in Gaza, don't believe him when he says he supports a two-state solution either, particularly given how clearly he opposes it when it comes to uh, Western, uh, Western Sahara. And indeed, if, uh, uh, if, if, if there, if, regarding both occupations, the reason there is no peace is that the United States and a number of other Western countries take the positions that the two sides need to work it out among themselves. And even if you take the position that both Morocco and Western Sahara have a right to exist as independent states, Israel and Palestine have the right to exist as independent states, Everybody has equal rights for sovereignty and self-determination and security and everything like that. It ignores the gross asymmetry in power between the occupier and those under occupation. And to say that, uh, you know, you know, they, 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 all this is, you can't, we can't have any movement towards peace unless both sides agree and we're not putting any pressure on the occupying power. What's the incentive to compromise? I mean, this would be like when Iraq invaded Kuwait in 1990. Like Israel and Morocco on the grounds that their weak neighbor was historically part of them at some point and was, you know, <laughs> um, we didn't say, oh, you two negotiate between yourselves as to how much of Kuwait that Iraq should hold on to and what, what, if any, it, if, if it should be independent, under what terms, that's up for you two to work it out among yourselves. No pressure, just, you know, talk, keep, keep talking endlessly in these negotiations that will go on for years and years and years, while, the, while Morocco would consolidate its control over what it called its 19th province, and et cetera, et cetera. No, no, no. Iraq, Iraq um, 
consolidated its control of what it called the 19th, uh, 19th pro uh, province. But of course not. Uh, the international community rallied and said we cannot accept a, a big state overrunning illegally and actually a small state. Now, personally, I, I think war could have been avoided. I, I didn't support the Gulf War, but the position of the international community that that was totally unacceptable was a valid one. Why isn't it being applied to uh, Palestine and um, and Western Sahara? Well, why why does uh, you know the United States uh, support these occupations and and I guess in certain ways uh, other other uh, other Western countries as well? And one would think that you know we hear in the West we hear about how in the West. Uh, we wish the Arab states would get it together and, and be secular and not be dominated by these Islamist theocrats, uh, that they would renounce terrorism, you know, be more democratic, that they would, uh, you know, support women's rights. Well, I mean, Western Sahara, I mean, if they want that kind of state in the Middle East, it seems that Western Sahara would be the one they would support. Because that's, you know, the, the Western Saharan government, the Sahrawi Arab Democratic Republic, they 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 they, 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 they uh, control not just the small strip of liberated lands in the uh, eastern desert, but they are the de facto government of 160,000 or more Sahrawis living in refugee camps in western Algeria. Algeria has given them true autonomy. When you get from the Tindouf airport in Algeria into the camps, you go through essentially go through customs. They are they are a government you know that has been self governing quite effectively for decades. They've had their internal struggles like any any government, but they have shown that they can create just this kind of state that the West supposedly wants. But instead, the West, the United States, and France in particular, are supporting this autocratic monarchy, trying to crush any hope of, pe of, of the people of Western Sahara establishing that kind of state on their own land. And again, why, and, and I, I mentioned some of the reasons, you know, the U.S. is supporting Morocco overall, but why, why, why taking over Western Sahara? My sense, and I think this is that it's less about opposition of, of an independent Western, uh, Western Sahara per se, because Palisario, like a lot of socialist movements, you know, in, in the global south uh, from the 60s and 70s, you know, has, has moderated quite a bit. They say, oh, we, we believe in a free market. We believe in a democracy. We're in Atlantic power. They really bend over backwards, you know, to, you know, we're not aligned, you know, you know they they're, they're, they're really tried to um, um, you know, make a, you know, to, 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 to again, not, not see themselves as any kind of threat to Western interests and, and interest whatsoever. I don't think there is concern about an uh, independent state per se. I think the, the biggest concern, frankly, is uh, that uh, they, um, is that we want to stick with Morocco because uh, the, 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 the king, the whole system in Morocco is being challenged a lot. Uh, the corruption is really rampant. Uh, not, it's not as repressive as it used to be, but it's, it's, it's still the definite denial of, of, of human rights. Um, the, there's gross inequality uh, in terms of social statistics, like you know, life expectancy, infant mortality, nutrition, things like that. It's, it's not doing as well as, as most other North African states, um, even though it's you know, wealthy enough. Um, that there's a lot of dissatisfaction, and I think there's fear that if there was a free and fair referendum, which the um, you know the, the pro independence people would almost certainly win. Uh, the Moroccan people would be pretty upset because almost all Moroccans have bought into the line that the Moroccan line that oh these people are Moroccans they're happy to be Moroccans and only a few paid Algerian agents that are uh, you know uh, uh, trying to stir up trouble and, if, and if, if they found that was not true there'd be a lot of bitterness about all the resources incredible amount of money that Morocco has poured in to consolidate its occupation. And the lives lost from the years of war and everything like that. I think there's there's fear that it would be the the last straw for a lot of Moroccans, and the monarchy might be in trouble to be replaced by who knows what. 
personally, I think Morocco, the, the monarchy is actually a little more stable than that. But I think that that, that might be the um, might be the fear. I know I'm getting short on time, so I don't want to go too much about why the U.S. supports Israel. But just let me say very briefly that I think there's a misunderstanding, especially, especially overseas, that is mostly about the uh, Zionist lobby. And the, the Zionist lobby does have influence, to be sure. It's limited to maybe some people in Congress. But Congress doesn't make foreign policy. And Congress is largely reactive. The executive branch really is in charge of foreign policy. And the, uh, the lobby can make it difficult to challenge U.S. policy. Um, and uh, it makes it more difficult to change U.S. policy. But the overall thrust of the policy, I would argue, would be the same even without the lobby. And I mentioned how we support other occupations like Morocco, Indonesia, you know, South Africa. We certainly supported allies engaged in genocidal wars. Guatemala against the indigenous peoples in the 1980s. Turkey against the Kurds in the 1990s, Indonesia and East Timor. And just a few years ago, Saudi Arabia is terror bombing in Yemen. And we supported all sorts of repressive right-wing governments around the world. Why should Israel be different? I mean, this idea that suddenly the United States would be concerned about human rights and international law in the Middle East, going for the lobby, as if the United States had been concerned about human rights and international law anywhere else. I mean, seriously, folks, don't, 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 uh, um, don't, uh, let, let's not ex exaggerate the, the power of the Zionists. Frankly, when one thing that bothers me, just briefly, is that I think there's kind of a tendency and kind of an unaware anti Semitism that comes in where you kind of exaggerate the power of wealthy Jews to, you know, manipulate things and, and control, control stuff. And, and I think a lot of the exaggeration of the Zionist lobby, you know, kind of um, falls into that, you know, which is it's a, which is not to say it's not any cement to criticize them for where they are when they do create a climate of intimidation in some places and they do interfere. And it's certainly not any cement to criticize Israel, criticize Zionism, anything like that. But again, I'd be cautious about over exaggerating the the influence of, of wealthy Jews in terms of. Uh, of U.S. And, and the policy of other um, of other Western uh, um, Western nations. Um, just a couple of words about linkage. Um, the Polisario and the Western Terrans themselves have long had great solidarity and support for the Palestinian struggle. Unfortunately, that has not been reciprocated. Um, Fatah, you know, the dominant party of uh, the PLO, the Palestine Authority supports you know, uh, largely the Moroccan uh, position. They haven't formally recognized the annexation, but they generally support Morocco on this. Uh, the, uh, and Hamas, if, if there's a small Palestinian uh, Sahrawi Western Sahara solidarity group in Gaza, and Hamas shut it down a couple of years ago. Uh, some of the, there, there are a few uh, leftist and intellectual, uh, left progressive intellectual voices in Palestinian society to support the uh, Sahrawis, but 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 their minority. When Nelson Mandela assumed office, majority rule in South Africa, he was planning to recognize Western Sahara and uh, Yasser Arafat called him up and, and talked him out of it, though his successor, successor President Zuma, did uh, recognize uh, Western Sahara. And that's been very disappointing, you know, for the Palestinians. And, and indeed, while the Arab, the, the uh, African countries support Western Sahara overwhelmingly, Latin American countries support Western Sahara overwhelmingly, uh, the Arab world, unfortunately, with the exception of Algeria, pretty much, um, has uh, um, uh, largely supported uh, uh, the Moroccan uh, monarchy. Um, and what's what's in, in, important in both of these cases? is that there's a lot more at stake than just the Sahrawi people and the Palestinian people. What's at stake is the international legal order, the, uh, and, 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 uh, which has been, at least on the record, since the end of the Second World War. Yeah, this is the rules-based international order you hear um, uh, Biden and NATO leaders and others talking about in reference to the Ukraine, that countries can't expand their territory by force. Uh, that uh, 
you have to respect international boundaries. You can't deny people their right of self-determination. And you know, the trouble is, is if, if, for example, uh, Morocco's autonomy plan is accepted, as the Americans, the French, Spaniards, and other governments have been calling for, it'll be the first time since the founding of the United Nations that a colonized people, a, a non recognized non self governing territory, has been denied the right of self determination. And it'll be the first time that a country has been allowed to expand its territory by force and have that recognized by the international community. So what at stake is not just, you know, the, the fate of these, these people, yeah. but again, the, the, the international order. And then the thing, again, that the, the hypocrisy, the double standards on Ukraine is obvious. I've been to Africa three times um, since the Russian invasion. And every time I try to, you know, at least partly defend U.S. policy and, and, and speak out against Russian aggression, Russian imperialism, everybody from cab drivers to foreign ministry officials immediately bring up Western Sahara. Um, and uh, again, this, this, this really hurts the, 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 we, you know, the, the, the credibility of Western democracies. The, um, but in terms of the, um, of, 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 of what can be done around Palestine and Western Sahara, as again, I look, go back to East Timor. Remember East Timor, um, 30 years ago, was seen as the ultimate hopeless cause, the ultimate triumph of realpolitik, where a powerful nation swallow a weaker nation and the international community would not respond, would not be able, would not refuse to reverse it. In fact, East Timor was in worse shape than Western Sahara in law was. Because you know, I mentioned Western Sahara has been recognized by up to 84 countries, whereas East Timor was only recognized by three. <laughs> um, the um, the United Nations has completely dropped it from the agenda. While well, at least in Western Sahara, they at least have to renew the mandate of the peacekeeping force every six months, even though it's not doing anything. Um, but the um, eventually. But what happened was, and again, my, my, uh, the, the armed struggle in East Timor was even weaker than the armed struggle in Western Sahara. Um, and the repression of Indonesia was so incredible. I mean, they wiped out literally a third of that island state's population, over 200,000 people. The only thing that saved Western Sahara was global civil society, mobilizing, organizing, essentially shaming Western governments like the US, like Britain, like Australia, like Canada and others from supporting uh, Indonesia. And so when the Indonesian economy collapsed in 1999 with the big Southeast Asia uh, meltdown, Western nations would say, hey, we'd like to help you guys out, but this East Timor thing is making it impossible. And of course, Indonesia have a referendum, which they lost and East Timor is now free. And look at the South apartheid South Africa. Again, by the by the real politic, the realist you know, paradigm of international relations, why should Western nations have, have put sanctions in South Africa? Foreign corporations got twice their return, average return on investment in South Africa of any other part of, part of the world. Yeah, because you had the combination of a consumer, wealthy consumer society and the white population, a poor, exploited third world labor force. In the black majority. And South Africa was an ally in the Cold War and all that. And yet, campaigns for boycotts, divestment, sanctions throughout the Western world, solidarity moved in South Africa, finally forced Western nations to impose the sanctions, which forced the release of Mandela, negotiations which led to majority rule. Which leads us to the current boycott, divestment, sanctions campaign regarding the Israeli occupation of Palestine. I would like to see that extended and linked to Western Sahara. There is a small scale BDS campaign on Western Sahara, but it hasn't gotten a lot of attention. It would be great if the campaigns could come together. 
Now, there are some Palestinian activists who say, no, we don't want, it's going to dilute our, our efforts around Palestine. We can't be distracted. Right? We, but the Palestinians have their own case, and, and we don't, we don't, but, but it, I think it would actually strengthen the Palestine solidarity campaign. Because if we included Morocco's occupation as well, remember, this is the only, I mean, I mean the countries, I think, morally have the right to self-determination, like Tibet, you know, for example, or Chechnya, or Kashmir, or West Papua. But in terms of what's legally recognized by the international community as non-self-governing uh, countries under foreign belligerent occupation, they deny the right of self-determination. Palestine and Western Sahara are the only ones. So if you could link the two, people would no longer say, oh, why are you singling out Israel? Why are you singling out the world's only Jewish state? I said, no, Morocco's a Muslim Arab state. This is not about Jews. This is about self-determination. This is about international law. This is about human basic human rights. And it would help avoid the divisive arguments you get about the nature of Zionism or this or that and the other, and get it right really down to the basics that could build the kind of unity for a bigger movement. And besides, frankly, I think the always deserve our solidarity just as much as the Palestinians. Um, so I, I think this is really the only way, because if you look at Western Sahara, the armed struggle is not going to get anywhere. I mean, the age of, of drones, open desert warfare, <laughs> you know, they, they don't, it's, at most it's propaganda of the deed. They cannot defeat the Moroccans militarily. Moroccan, I mean, Morocco's population is 40 times that of Western Sahara. Um, the, obviously, the diplomatic route isn't going anywhere because mostly of French and American uh, efforts to block it. Uh, the, I'm a great believer in the power of strategic nonviolent action, you know, the ability to bring down dictatorships. And we saw how it uh, freed the Baltic republics from. Russian occupation, for that matter, India from British occupation and the like. But if you look at, uh, yeah, but but uh, in Western Sahara, Moroccan settlers outnumber the indigenous population by a ratio of three to one. Now. And nonviolent resistance usually can only work if you represent a majority of the uh, of the people. So, um, I really, I really, the, the East Timor model, the South Africa model, really is the only hope global civil society. And we've seen this great explosion of civil society activism and solidarity in Palestine in recent months. And I'm really hoping we can see that with Western Sahara. Yeah. So, for those of you who want to have a little bit more intimate knowledge about Western Sahara, It was very interesting. You had many interesting things I didn't know about for Sahara, etc. But I disagree with you when you say terrorist Palestinian organizations. Mm -hmm. When the colonized people make struggle and struggle and not struggle, it's always against the colonial power. You saw that general people, the South African people, made it what the imperialists call terrorists. But we should not call it terrorists. Because every time the colonized people react, it's against the superpower. Mm -hmm. It's one thing. And then uh, I just want to say that the Moroccan, uh, many of the, in Morocco, there has been a group uh, working against the normalization. So it's optimistic. But what I want to ask you and first say again is imperialism, they don't care for human rights, they don't care for international law, they only care for their interest. As you told us, as far as Israel, 
it's a project for Western imperialism. So how the satellite state in the Middle East to spread and devise the other people, it has succeeded in that. We can David agreement with Egypt, with normalization, with the first thing. But what is the interest of US imperialism and European imperialism in supporting the Morocco occupation? This is my question. Sure. Thanks. It's a good question. Yeah. Um, let's see if I can remember uh, and cover everything. Um, Briefly, in regard to our question of terrorism, is that uh, oppressed people do have a right to resist, including armed resistance. Uh, but um, it's, it's never legal, whether you are an oppressor or oppressed, uh, to target civilians. And uh, the uh, popular, uh, you know, the, the legal definition of terrorism is those who um, um, attack, uh, deliberately attack uh, you know, civilians for uh, political for a political purpose. And um, unfortunately, the term is usually used only for irregular groups, not states. You know, all know that states are the ones for the, who inflict the primary terrorism. In fact, the word terror comes from the terror well, after the French Revolution, you know, when the state power was you know, chopping off a lot of heads. But um, the um, and even when you look at the Hamas attack, you know, they, they primarily uh, the primary targets actually uh, were these um, left wing kibbutzim on the border. Uh, a couple of places that I visited, and including a, a woman who was narrowly escaped death. Who a lot of those friends of hers died. She she'd been arrested and beaten up many times by Israeli occupation forces trying to protect uh, Bedouin villages from demolition. Um, similarly, you know, people who go to raves that was another big target. Don't tend to be big supporters of Netanyahu or the occupation either. Um, but you know, so I do I do take the position that is that that no matter how oppressed you are, no matter how Powerful your enemy is, you you don't have the right just to 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 um, kill civilians, and I'm not shy about calling that terrorism. But again, it should be seen in the larger perspective, the larger context of the, where the real oppression comes comes from, and why people resort to such extreme measures. Uh, in terms of the um, U.S. and 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 and, and, and or uh, interest in, in imperialism in, in Morocco is again the Morocco has been a big supporter of imperialism during the Cold War. I mentioned the intervention in Africa and elsewhere. And even way back in the 70s, they were they were already quietly working with the Israelis. And so the US was using them to try to normalize relations. Yeah. <laughs> Fancy word of saying let's get Arab dictatorships to recognize Israel so we can uh, the Palestinians had no leverage. <laughs> um and again the war on terror, so called Again, the, the, the role that Morocco plays. And the fact that this free trade agreement came down was that at a time when more and more countries were challenging the neoliberal model, Morocco was playing along with it very much so by privatization and bringing in foreign capital and doing all the good stuff that the IMF wanted them to do. They were the great model of how Africa should, should develop you know, along Western imperialist lines. And in terms of international law, I'll, I'll be frank, I mean, my own politics come from a decidedly left-wing perspective. And I'm not naive about uh, law and how law has been used. And I'm not naive about the limits of international law and the United Nations system. At the same time, it can be a vehicle, it can be a tool to uh, fight back against the, some of the worst excesses of imperialism. That it is it is because international law is that that that, that uh, uh, nation states, including imperialist powers, will use international law when it's to their uh, benefit, and uh, will cite it and pretend they care about it, pointing out the hypocrisy, pointing out the double standards, uh, can be a powerful tool in challenging the imperialism. That and just like domestically. That you know, you may have a radical view of how you want society to be restructured, but as, but in doing it helps to have a liberal order where you can legally organize, you know, without uh, you know, autocratic repression. We can use you can use liberal frameworks for more radical goals, and that's why I am I, I really push on the theme of international law when I'm talking about. Palestine, we're talking about Western Sahara. I guess you could say international law, you know, like liberal uh, structures elsewhere, are a necessary but not sufficient tool for creating a, a more radical transformation of society that I and I think a lot of you all would like to like to see. 
Yeah, I, I just want to say one comment before the next one is coming on. The uh, armed resistance against the pirates in Africa was never against the Libyans. There were civilian casualties, but that was was not a part of the strategy or the plan. It's only to say that that's a liberation moment and I was talking about those on there. I was thinking now that Morocco and, and Israel have become such close friends, can you imagine that when the war in Gaza ends, of course you can imagine that Israel is, is completely stripped of all decency mm -hmm. by 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 many people yes. in the world, practically everyone, uh, even Jews in Denmark and and uh, and many other places. Can you imagine that this uh, somehow could uh, affect Morocco also? Yeah, well, yeah, it, it certainly has. Um... What Israel's done has, has, has certainly been, been a, a shock to, to a lot of a lot of places. Uh, in terms of just, just, just how extreme mm. the uh, the killing has been and how barbaric mm. uh, the, the practices have been, and it certainly has put off indefinitely any talk of a Saudi Arabia normalizing relations or anything like that. Because even really really authoritarian regimes like the Saudis have to at least in some way listen to their people and literally 99% of them right now are um, very strongly opposed to, to Israel. I don't see um, Morocco reversing its recognition um, primarily because that would then get, you know, get an opening for Israel and United States to reverse their <laughs> recognition of Morocco's annexation. But uh, and it has not stopped. And during this period, Morocco accepting Israeli technology and military technology, uh, including uh, uh, drone technology, which the um, Israelis have been using against uh, uh, not just the Polisario, but uh, civilian traffic in the in, in the liberated zones. Sorry, sorry. Are you conscious? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> okay. um, and, uh, and, and, and Morocco not, not just using it against the Polisario, but against Morocco using it against you know, civilian traffic and and uh, you know, Algerian truck drivers and Mauritanian truck drivers and others. Um, and also the, 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 the Pegasus spyware, you know, there's Mar Moroccans have been using to track uh, the, the nonviolent resistance that's going on in the occupied territory and, and uh, other yeah, kinds and of... This is also movement outside from what to say. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, it, it, this is um, so. I think, and, and though I think it, it's, it's set back normalization efforts with a number of Arab countries, I, I, I don't think it's going to impact Morocco that much because you know the occupiers of the world unite. You know? <laughs> uh, yeah, I, th I, I think actually uh, Iran asked about what interest do we uh, have in Morocco, and I think there's one European thing, uh, mm -hmm. and that mm -hmm. is the, the issue of refugees. Uh, Morocco is like Turkey, uh, a kind of the EU insurance that there's not too many African uh, refugees yeah. coming through Morocco and mainly to Spain, of course. That would yes. be yeah, I mean, so that's, a, that's a key issue for the European Union. Uh, is that yeah, Spain, Spain in particular, because this, you know, Spain is, is a former colonial power. You know, there, there's been a lot of solidarity movements there. There's, there's collective guilt about it. I mean, many people thought maybe like Portugal, you know, in terms of East Timor, they might, you know, <laughs> try uh, to make amends by supporting independence. But if anything, Morocco has gotten more, I mean, Spain has gotten more pro-Moroccan, even under the, the, uh, under the uh, Socialist Workers' Party, which is so, a social democratic party. But again, Morocco has uh, I mean, uh, 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 threatened to open the floodgates of uh, migrants if that happens. Because remember, Spain has these two little presidios on the Moroccan mainland, which are Spanish territory, not to mention what is it only uh, like 17 kilometers across the uh, um, Straits of Gibraltar? And um, just for example, when the president of Western Sahara had a bad case of COVID a year and a half ago, he went to um, Spain for hospital treatment. And the Moroccans let down the border in Melilla, one of the Presidios, and thousands of uh, migrants poured in just over, over a day, a day and a half. And that was sort of a warning. You know, if you, I mean, and, and so if you did anything more. And of course, who gets hurt politically if there is a big upsurge in migration? 
this tends to be the left parties, right? And who gains? The far right parties. So I think there's sort of a calculation. Well, we, we, we don't want the far right to take over. So it's worth, you know, abandoning the uh, 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 the, the Western Saharans. But I think there's one it's interesting uh, observation by the UN is that most of the people who are coming out of Morocco as refugees are Moroccans. Mm -hmm. The reason for that is that you have the Sahara Desert and you have the beam of two and a half thousand kilometers mm -hmm. through Western Sahara and you have a, a couple of million line, uh, landmines. Mm -hmm. So it means it's difficult to come from Mauritania to uh, to Spain if you don't go to the Canary Islands. And they they have no say there because they're not good. They're not, their starting point is not Morocco. And, and, the, and the Algerian Moroccan border is closed. I mean, literally, it is the only border in the world besides North and South Korea where you cannot cross by land. I mean, the relation, relations are that bad. <laughs> and in terms of other interests, I should mention, of course. Um, uh, Western Sahara has some of the richest phosphate deposits in the world, as well as some of the richest fishing grounds. And there's a uh, case between, and on a number of occasions, uh, the EU has tried to get free trade agreements, fishery agreements with Morocco. Morocco has insisted on including, including Western Sahara. So the EU, wanting these trade agreements, says, okay, someone they, they're, they're taken to the European court. The European court says, no, Western Sahara is not part of Morocco. You know, just like you can't say uh, you know, get get products from the West Bank and say it's part of Israel. You know, you can't um, do this, and they, they've invalidated the the agreements. There's they're, they're trying a third time, and the decision should be coming down maybe in June. Um, and a bad sign was just a week or so ago. Uh, the 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 the, the uh, um, forget what's the current title. I'll advocate a uh, general advocate. Of the the yeah, 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 came out with this very preliminary observation that seemed that appeared to favor Morocco, uh, which is a reversal of the, all the other court uh, decisions and the broad international legal consensus. And so there's a real fear right now that um, uh, that if this uh, this agreement comes through, it would uh, amount to a de facto recognition by the European Union of uh, of Morocco's uh, uh, illegal illegal annexation. So, in June, we will know more. Then it, it's the seventh case around agreements between the European Union and Morocco. It's from. But I should mention, in terms of BDS stuff, that it has had an impact. I mean, uh, you know, Norway has this huge, um, you know, what, what do you call it, the fund? Or they, they, uh, the oil, fund. oil fund. You know, they, they, they invested in a huge, big, big investment portfolio, single investment portfolio in the world. And they have divested from any companies doing anything in, in Western Sahara. Yeah. Um, the uh, a number uh, and 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 and, uh, <clears throat> and, uh, and uh, Kerr McGee, which is a notorious uh, um, a petrochemical a petrochemical uh, uh, energy firm in the United States, uh, they have pulled out of Western Sahara because of the pressure, and, and a number of others. Have as well. There's a group I re highly re I recommend that owns on the on the board actually the Western Sahara Resource Watch. You can find their website, and that you know, will give you an idea of some of the uh, BDS type activities and uh, other efforts to you know to address the economic issues vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, Western Sahara. Yeah. So it's it's mostly mo mostly focused on disinvestments. And the reason for that is that the investments in Western Sahara is keeping the occupied occupation going. As long as there's a good profit in occupying Western Sahara, then the, the, the Moroccans will have an interest. In the same minute it become a cost to occupy the neighboring country and not a gain, then they will make it face fast. The international law is, is very clear that if you are, if, 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 uh, you cannot uh, exploit resources from territories under occupation, or colonies and non-self-governing territories, of which you know, Western Sahara meets all those descriptions, you cannot exploit the natural resources unless the you know, unless they, they're brought that they're put back into the community, back into the territory. Now Morocco says, well, we've actually put more into the territory than we've taken out in terms of financial resources, which technically is true. But the vast majority of that has been to as subsidies for Moroccan settlers. 
and for political repression and military activity. Virtually none has gone to the indigenous Sabrawi population. More questions? One more for you. Uh, I know, of course, that in Morocco, it's illegal to speak favorably about the uh, independence of West Africa. Mm -hmm. I know you can't do that, and no political parties do that. But Frisera claim that they have like, connections, relationship with, with Moroccan dissidents and with Moroccan political parties that are against the king. What What do you think would happen if if the king is overthrown and if they have a revolution in Morocco? Yeah. Right? There's been there's been attempts by by uh, Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think the, the, the I mean. <laughs> I don't think there's going to be. I don't think the king is seriously threatened. I mean, the last time they had a, there were two attempted coups in the early seventies. It came very, very close to succeed. In fact, that's really why, personally, I think that the, uh, he he ordered the Green March and the takeover of Western Sahara. Frankly, it wasn't just the phosphates or or mineral sources that I. He wanted a nationalist cause to get people to rally around the flag. He was seen. This is this is the side. This is during the real the heyday of Arab nationalism. He was seen as kind of you know neo-colonial francophile, you know whatever. And these are left-leaning nationalist officers, and so he was saying, "Well, I will embrace the skit thou the whole the nationalist card by taking over South the Western Sahara. Everybody rally around the flag for this great national cause. And it's an anti-colonial cause because you know Spain is Western Sahara is a Spanish colony. So I'm not I'm not a neo-colonialist. I'm anti-colonial." And um, and, uh, and it also had the advantage of keeping the army as far away from Rabat as possible. Uh, so uh, I, think, I think that that was that was I think the initial uh, motivation. At this point, I, I think I think uh, um, the, the 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 state is is still pretty pretty strong. But you're right about the repression. I mean, even though again Morocco's liberalized so much. I mean, in terms of what we sometimes have students that do years a year abroad in in Morocco. And what people tell them is that, you know, you can actually talk politics. Unlike some countries in that part of the world, you can you can talk politics in, in, the, in the cafes and, you know, with your Moroccan students. But there are three things you, you can't talk about. One is, you know, obviously um, criticize Islam. Uh, the second is to say anything negative about the royal family or questions about their finances or, you know, that kind of thing. And the third is any questions around questioning the national unity of Morocco, meaning you know, anything about Western Sahara. Those are the three forbidden uh, uh, forbidden things. Uh, and as a result, you, know, you really do have a lot of Moroccans, including liberal Moroccans, you know, and they leftist Moroccan. They both the Socialist Party and the Communist Party supported the takeover of Western Sahara. You know, um, so, you know, it, 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 I mean, you know, just, just like I think a lot of them, um, we, we we all have some you know Jewish friends who are fairly progressive in a lot of issues that are have kind a of pretty narrow vision around Israel. You know, they're similarly you know there are a lot of the even somewhat progressive uh, Moroccans that have kind of a you know narrow vision when it comes to Western Sahara. And so yeah, that, that is the vast majority. But you, you are having you know some voices, some in the some in the far left, some in some moderate Islamist opposition. They're, they're seeing a few pockets and. Um, in uh, uh, and some intellectuals uh, quiet again because you know you can get in big trouble. Uh, some growing dissent and 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 part of it is is um, Sahrawi students going to Moroccan universities get involved in some of the uh, uh, dissident politics there. Very similar to what interesting the Timorese did in Indonesian universities. Mm -hmm. The growing movement against Saharto, you know, they would say, hey, you know how the the regime has lied to you about this and that and the other. Well, guess what? They've also lied to you about East Timor. You know, and, and and so they actually, you know, by making uh, alliances with the broader dissident movement, we're able to make some inroads. And we're seeing some some uh, examples of, of that in Morocco as well. But it's, it's pretty, un unfortunately, it's still on the margins, but it, it's growing. More questions? Yes. Uh, I visited the emergency camp 37 years ago in Algeria. How are they developed from then to now? Uh, well, they're, they're much larger. Thirty-seven years. Oh yeah, well, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, they're since. Yeah, well, they're they're much larger. I mean, uh, they they uh, the population growth rate is pretty high there. Fertility yeah. rate's pretty high, so so it's uh, much bigger. And they're mostly permanent structures now, not not tents. So uh, they are, and most of them have electricity. 
Um, they are still uh, they're still struggling. Um, I mean, and, and I mean the you know per capita caloric intake is not as high as uh, optimal. You know, but um, it's still uh, good to donate to charities that are you know providing food relief and, and that kind of thing. Um, but uh, the uh, population is highly educated. I mean, it has the highest literacy rate in Africa. It's, you know, getting like you know ninety eight percent or something like that. It's quite quite remarkable. And um, most of them speak, in addition to um, Hassaniya, which is the dialect of Arabic that they speak. Uh, quite a few of them uh, speak Spanish, and uh, and and some other uh, uh, European languages as well. Um, and you know, it, it's it's uh, like I say, fairly uh, um, you know, relatively democratic, peaceful uh, society. But of course, you know, you're stuck in the hottest part of the Sahara Desert, and um, you know, they keep people active by um, getting people in these various functional committees of, of self-help and things like that. It's not quite as much the ega you know, strictly egalitarian. I mean, it, it, you know, um, you know, uh, I mean, it, it was a uh, uh, you know, kind of a, a system they have there. You, you know, you have uh, private businesses now, and and you know, and um, and 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 you know, again, more of a market uh, economy. Um, but it's a um, um, you know, but but you know, they really they really do do their their best to to make sure people's uh basic needs. But part of it is, is that they're they're bored and they're restless. They want to they want to go back home. You know, make other again. They're stuck there in the middle of this freaking desert, and uh, you know, you, you're, you're, if you, uh, the Algerians generally, you know, it's very hard for you to get into the Algerian area unless you have a really good reason to. And if you, you know, cross into, um, you know, Morocco, you get to get hit there and, and into, into the, the, or cross into Western Sahara, you could be hit, hit by a Moroccan drone. Uh, I mean, part of the idea of going to the, to the returning to the armed struggle was the, they're the really restless, pissed off youth who wanted to do something. And uh, you know, this gives them something to do: military training and occasional hit and run uh, attacks. But they had the farms, then uh, growing bitches. Like well, yeah, yeah, those are those are very impressive. They use these solar powered um, uh, pumps that would get the water out and, and irrigate these uh, these large gardens and things like that. Though, though, even today, they are um, they're generally enough to sort of you know provide food for people in hospitals and for things like that. They still have to import the, the vast amount of their uh, vast amount of their, their food. And just to say that the groundwater, there's plenty of groundwater under the desert, but the, there's too much salt in it. So you cannot use it for agriculture or drinking it without purifying it first and get the salt out of the water. So so um, yeah, that is a, a major Some issue. places there was salt in, and some places there weren't. They had the, uh, yeah. yeah, that was what they told us. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, it's actually, if you look, if you look at the channels of the irrigation gardens, you'll see you you will see a few little salt deposits. But uh, apparently, that with with some some filters, you can you can get at least some of it out enough to not kill the tomatoes or whatever. I think one of the biggest changes in the camps was the establishment of the cell phone networks. Oh yeah, it means that from one day to the other, you're going from having the slowest internet you could get in the world to everybody was from the net. Yeah, and then they can communicate with their relatives in the occupied territories. And that's been the biggest thing in the occupied territories. I mean, the repression there is severe. I mean, um, Human Rights Watch is listed as among the worst of the worst, along with North Korea, Uzbekistan, Syria, um, Sudan. You know, I mean, it, it is really, yeah. Um, and I think even Freedom House, which is a U.S. NGO, which if anything has something of a Western bias, they, they rank, I think, you know, again, the, the, the among the along with, you know, Syria and one or two of the others is having the least political rights of any country in the world. So very, very repressive there. And um, but, you know, thanks to a uh, cell phone, you know, you can film the police when they start beating people up and uh, and, um, you know, kind of get the get the word out. And uh, that has really helped in terms of international solidarity and really understanding the thing. Because uh, you may notice the post poster there that visit Western Sahara. If you look closely, it says try to visit Western Sahara because almost any time that um, an NGO 
or, 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 or journalists or others tries to get into the occupied territory, unless they are part of some escorted rocket propaganda thing, they're expelled or not even allowed to get off the plane. Uh, um, so it's a, um, again, it's a highly, highly repressive situation. Again, the irony of Western countries supporting them could have a democratic alternative. When Secretary General, he appointed a new uh, personal envoy on Western Sahara more than two years ago. It took this personal envoy two years to be allowed to visit Western Sahara. Just to say, even even if you are a high-ranking uh, diplomat for the UN system, it's difficult to get. So, more questions? Take one down there. Where does was there another hand down there in the back? Yeah. 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 Oh, um, yeah. I I had a comment first about uh, the Zionist lobby and mm -hmm. the Congress. Yeah. Just a second, because we can discuss that about the problem with National Yeah, actually, I, I just speak on, but I'm, I'm old and have bad ass. Yes, yes. Uh, yeah, 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 I said that. I said, I said, I said that. It's fine to criticize APAC. I was just saying you shouldn't well, exaggerate your power. And that's, that's, that's what I was saying. Well, but it's very unique as a lobbying group for a foreign country yeah. in the United States. Now, also, the role it plays in Congress is not inconsequential because. Congress just passed a bill that suspended funding to UNRWA and also in that same bill passed continued aid to business. Yeah. But but my Biden had already suspended uh, uh a suspend, already suspended uh aid to UNRWA and that three point eight billion dollar request <laughs> was from the president directly. He wrote the bill. He wrote that part of the bill. Okay, so, yeah. Um I mean, and, and there are a few. I mean, there 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 are a few little, a few little other items that, um, you know, that certainly APAC had 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 a role in in, in putting in, um, but um, you know, but again, in, in, in the United States, the foreign policy is 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 an executive thing. If you look at every time APAC has confronted an American president, and the president who wanted to do something else. Eisenhower and Suez crisis in 1956, Carter in the first in, uh, uh, invasion of Lebanon in 1978, um, uh, Reagan and the AWACS deal to Saudi Arabia, Obama and the Iran nuclear deal, all these issues, APAC came out full blast to reverse it and the president always won. Similarly, when the president had wanted to put a stop to an Israeli military offensive, again, we have you have Eisenhower in 56, you have Nixon in 1973 in the October War, Carter again, 78, the Lebanon invasion, um, um, Reagan in 82, mm. during the uh, uh, second, the bigger invasion of, 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 uh, of, 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 of Lebanon, o Obama twice with Israeli wars in Gaza. You know, that, uh, you know, the, the president can just threaten to cut off aid and the offensive stops. And Biden could do that. This idea I keep hearing from uh, apologists for Biden in the United States, oh, he's trying his best for a ceasefire. He could, you know, he could stop the war. I mean, if, if Bernie Sanders and Elizabeth Warren had gotten the Democratic nomination where president now instead of Biden, the war had ended months ago. And APAC could not have prevented it. You know, this is this is very much you know, Biden's doing. And again, the executive branch really has the the, the power. It's not a parliamentary system where a uh, you know that where they where if you got enough MPs and a ruling coalition, you know to to, um, uh, to to block a policy, they can block a policy. You know the executive branch has enormous amount of leeway. Of course, what's frustrating right now in the United States is you have the vast majority of Americans wanting an immediate permanent ceasefire, wanting to to uh, suspend military aid to Israel, oppose what Israel's doing, but we are going to have a choice between two candidates, which we support. The war support unconditional military aid, which uh, you know that uh, you know, and, uh, and, and it's part of the flaws of the uh, the American uh, political system. And I know you have plenty of, plenty of complaints about your system here, <laughs> but at least with proportional representation, you know, progressive voices do have more of a voice in um, in, in challenging policies than you do in the United States. Yeah, more questions, comments.
Could you say well, a bit about uh, evangelical Christians related to this? Oh, yeah. So I should mention, in addition to, um, in, in addition to the, uh, I mean, the main reason U.S. supports Israel is a strategic reason. Israel seen as an asset for U.S. interest in the region. Um, you know, Israel by far the most powerful military. Uh, they are what the U.S. called, uh, one former Secretary of State called, our unsinkable aircraft carrier. Biden himself said, if it weren't for Israel, we'd have to invent them because we need the strategic ally. Our Arab allies could be overthrown in a coup or revolution. Israel's there to stay. Um, uh, it, Israel's uh, provided battlefield testing for American weapons. They trained U.S. forces in counterterrorism and counterinsurgency. Uh, they, they funneled U.S. arms to support allied regimes and allied insurgencies, including ones the U.S. couldn't give aid to for political reasons, like the Guatemalan junta, South Africa's apartheid regime, Nick Robin Contras, more recently, Colombian paramilitaries and various Kurdish groups. Um, you know, the CIA and Mossad collaborate in intelligence gathering and covert operations. The, um, uh, yeah, the mil military industrial complexes are closely intertwined. I mean, the $3.8 billion in that, in that bill, 90% of that goes to U.S. arms manufacturers. Yeah, that doesn't go directly to Israelis. Um, so, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's strategic reasons primarily, but there are also ideological reasons. Um, one is, I think, this, you, know, you probably know some of this here in Europe as well, that there's this older generation of liberals and social democrats. You have this kind of romantic, you know, that, that there's a you know, homeland for persecuted people, and Zionism is a national liberation movement, and, and they have all these progressive institutions, you know, the, you know, the, the social democracy, the universal health care, rights for women and the he would seen these wonderful socialist community uh, uh, communes you know all this kind of stuff um and they still are kind of stuck in that you know idealistic view of israel from you know 50 years ago which even back then there were you know contradictions and there was you know racism and there was all that kind of stuff but at least you know it had that facade now you know of course you can't even pretend that that's there but these these old liberals also still believe in it you know yeah, there's like you know, like people who still believe in Stalin, you know, even, <laughs> or whatever, because they're, they're, they're going for the ideal rather than the, uh, the reality, right? Um, so there's that romantic, that, and Biden is of that generation. Indeed, most policymakers in the United States are of that generation. Um, but but, uh, but then the other factor that Anne Louise was mentioning here, and this is the dominant force in the Republican Party, is that, as you know, the United States has a very high percentage of the population who are fundamentalist evangelical Protestants. You know, um, that, and and most of them see Israel as the fulfillment of biblical prophecy. They see Israel and Palestine, and Israel and Palestine as essentially Israelites and the Philistines. And we know whose side God is on, right? And many of them even believe that you need to rebuild the Second Temple and that is tear down the uh, Alaska Mosque and, and all that and, 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 and rebuild the second temple uh, for Jesus to come again. And of course, when he does, he's going to condemn all the Jews to eternal damnation. But, you know, they want the Jews for Act 1, not Act 2. Um, and the Israelis are happy to get their support because they're pretty confident that's not going to happen anyway. Um, and so, <laughs> and, so and, and, and the right wing fundamentalist. They dominate the Republican Party, and that's why they have all those really right-wing, you know, social issues, you know, on abortion and LGBTQ rights and all this kind of things, you know, and, and, and they they effectively control the agenda of the Republican Party. So, um, and and so that's that's a big factor too. So really, the, the main reasons are strategic, backed up by the kind of the, the uh, center-left ideological attachment to Israel and the right-wing Christian fundamentalist ideological uh, attachment to Israel. And yes, APAC kind of can reinforce that. APAC can make it harder to change that policy. APAC makes it harder to debate that policy. But again, I think the overall, and, and, and APAC can occasionally, you know, get Congress to throw in some, you know, legislation that, uh, you know, uh, strengthens U.S. support for Israel in this little area here, just this little area there. But again, the overall thrust of the policy would essentially be the same. 
No, I also think it's interesting that the right wing in Denmark is so keen on on Israel. It's uh, it's not just the right wing. No, it's not only the right wing, but but in my head, the social democrats are only right wing. <laughs> Don't worry. So, um, but but also, you know, that the, the, the that also, you know, the, the the former president of the Danish People's Party, Pierre Kjærsgaard, have visited the uh, Morocco many times eh? um, as the chair of the parliament. Don't, I didn't know that the chair of the parliament in Denmark had foreign policy on the hearings, but um, I didn't really know. So, so um, yeah. More questions? There were two things in the Western Sahara I thought was special. The first thing is that the Green March, march wasn't uh, voluntary, it was people forced into yeah. the Western Sahara. Mm -hmm. And, and the second thing is that the king of Morocco has a very special power position because he's not only the king, he's the leader of the armed forces and he's uh, connected to God. Yeah, commander of the faithful. Yeah, and, I mean, and, 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 that's... that's mm -hmm. the yeah. And the yeah. first, the first thing about the current... One person. Yeah, the, the, uh, the um, crazy thing about the current king is that he's outside of Morocco most of the time, especially hanging out with that German bodybuilder. I mean, it's a whole weird, weird stuff going on there. Um, and uh, he is, um, uh, yeah, he's not very involved in the day-to-day -day kind of things like his father was. His father was very actively involved. His, his father actually had a, a, a you know, political science degree from Sciences Po and was very involved in governmental affairs. I heard, heard a story that quite appropriately his uh, dissertation was on Machiavelli. Uh, but um, <laughs> the uh, um, he uh, um, yeah, but his son is 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 not not very well well connected. But again, the Moroccan state is is more than just the, the monarchy, and a lot of the generals got their hands in, into the uh, prof the profit making, you know, mm -hmm. from the phosphates fisheries and things like that, which is another personal motivation for holding on to the uh, uh, holding on to the territory. Uh, 16, 16 Moroccan fishing boats was getting support uh, from the European Union through the fishing agreement. 14 of them was owned by either the wife or the general himself already yeah, from the Moroccan yeah. yeah. army. So, so, they, so, so, so the EU uh, trade agreements of different kinds are also playing a role in, in keeping the system in, in, in place in Morocco. Many days. More questions? If not, there's yeah. one there. there. Yeah. Um, Two questions, like I guess, it's like if you can like speak about briefly about the natural resources, it's how mm -hmm. maybe to uh, to to why you know, Yeah, I mentioned that briefly. So phosphates and the fifth breeze is the main thing, and they are they are uh, definitely uh, profiting from that, helping to finance the war effort. I don't think that was the primary motivation for the invasion. I thought it was for nationalistic and political reasons, but. Um, that is certainly a factor. And then the cause, I mean, yeah, another thing about the resources is that it is a resource rich country. There are people who say, oh, it's a, you know, it's, it's too small. It would not be a viable state and that kind of thing. Because even though it's a, in, in terms of area, it's a, it's a fairly, fairly decent size. It's um, in the, the population is barely a half a million or so. But when you count the resources, I mean, it would, it would be the per capita income would actually be quite, quite solid and plenty enough to, um, Sustain the population, and and the uh, Polisario have, have shown that they can be quite uh, good at gov gov governance with the, with the very poor resources. They would you know, probably do be a lot better uh, if they could actually have to control their own own resources. I think talking a bit about resources, there's also sand, it was exported to the beaches in uh, the Canary Islands. Uh, what is more and more important? Then there's the production of salt. Right. Um, who has also exported to the European market, but mainly road salt, you know, for when it's cold and it's snowing and so on. Um, but the phosphate is, is big. The fish is uh, probably the biggest foreign trade uh, there is. 91% uh, of all the fish in the fishery agreement between the EU and Morocco is uh, is fish from Western Sahara. So, so they, the reason for that is that they, 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 they the uh, Gulf uh, current are hitting Africa just outside the 
the coast of uh, Western Sahara. So, so there's a lot of tuna and other things. And it's mainly Spanish fishers who are, are utilizing that in the fishing industry. <laughs> so, um, and phosphate is a uh, commodity, there's not much of, you make fertilizer, fertilizer out of uh, phosphate, and there's very few uh, depots left of, of this uh, mineral. It's pretty uh, critical for our agriculture. Yeah. So, um, so that is, the price on that is very high. Uh, we have a, quite a lot of success stories in Denmark, all companies and banks and supermarkets who are pulled out of Western Sahara, all Danish major supermarkets don't trade goods from Western Sahara. And there's a very, very good model, I actually mentioned Namibia and the uh, uh, EDS uh, uh, campaign when White South Africa. One of my first actions was when I was 19 years old and I'd go into these supermarkets that had Del Marti, Marti sardines and yeah. products of South Africa. Mm -hmm. And I got these little stickers that said, stolen from the people of Namibia. Stolen from the people of Namibia. Stolen from. Uh, and Trump is calling Namibia, Namibia. Yeah. 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 More questions? You have two questions. Yeah, to, um, this is more personal. I want to ask you if you have some, I don't know, goal in the future because you mentioned like Palestine in contrast, the approach, the Palestinian approach to resistance yeah. in contrast to the. Yeah, I, 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 I hope, hope for both, both, both the country, both the peoples is global civil society. And again, what we saw in Namibia, what we saw in East Timor, what we saw, what we saw with the downfall of apartheid, you know, that is global civil society can, um, I mean, even if you take the position, again, the realist, realpolitik positions, uh, you know, countries are, governments are amoral. They don't really care about international law or human rights or these kind of values things. Everything is in their strategic, narrow strategic interest. It's about asserting military power. Again, even if you take that very hardcore kind of uh, view of international relations, even if you, again, assume that governments are amoral, people are moral. People do have values. People do have consciences. There are a lot of people who do care about right and wrong. And there are people who can force their governments to change things. And as someone who was born and spent my early years in the American South, and segregation was the law of the land, when I couldn't go to a city park or an amusement park or a movie theater with half of my friends because they were a different color, when we had to drink out of separate drinking fountains, and I saw how people rose up nonviolently and were able to reverse centuries of segregation. When in coming to age, I saw my country in a long, immoral, horrific war in Vietnam, supported by both vast majorities of both of the represent people in Congress of both political parties, presidents of both political parties, and people rose up through massive resistance and got us out of Vietnam. Mm -hmm. I mentioned the anti-apartheid movement. I mentioned uh, East Timor. But, but you know, there's also getting the U.S. out of Central America and allowing the Arias Peace Plan to take effect, ending the civil wars there. Mm -hmm. And getting the United States, at least mostly, out of Iraq. <laughs> and I could go down the list. Um, I think one reason we're still here is that the disarmament movement and the freeze movement at least curbed to some degree the nuclear arms race. So I really do have, and I, I'm old enough to have witnessed and experienced and actually taken part in <laughs> many of these movements that have made a difference. So that's 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 the, that's the one thing I, I can hold out on because, again, though oppressed people have the right to arms struggle, I see no way of military victory. For Palestine, Western Sahara, not out civil resistance can't work when you're or when you're under when you're, you're outnumbered. The United States and other countries in nature, the diplomatic group won't go. The United Nations can't do its job, and that leaves it leaves it to us. It leaves it, it leaves it to us to make the difference. Yeah. I saw a post uh, yesterday as one of the Palestinian demonstrations. I think it was very clear. Like, <clears throat> When, uh, when hundreds of thousands and millions of people are walking the streets to, to defend children's rights and women's rights not to be bombed, and they have no reaction from our leaders, we have a problem with humanity. I think that is as here it is. You know, uh, most people, it's not a matter what color or religion you have. 
nobody wants to accept this kind of of barbaric uh, actions by by governments and mm. military. Yeah. And at that that that, that raised moments, mm. and you are now visiting one of the moments who who was fighting apartheid in South Africa many many years ago. Well, that seemed like a hopeless cause. I mean, did, did, I mean did we, we really think that if, you know, uh, for, did, well, you know, will come out of prison. Yeah, that yeah. was a great dream. And, you know, and people had inspirational speeches about that. But frankly, I, I did not think I would see Mandela as president. I mean, we were both we were both involved very yeah. much in the anti apartheid movement. Yeah. Did you think we'd ever see Mandela? No. Or, yeah. when, when, they, when, when they released him, I think they probably die after we... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or yeah. he's mad. Or... Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, 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 so, and you know, even when it feels hopeless, like, you know, we had these mass demonstrations. I mean, during the Vietnam War, I remember... 1969, you know, you had you know a million people, millions of people in the street protesting the Vietnam War. So it was not, we're not making any difference. Well, we now know that Nixon was planning to use tactical nuclear weapons against North Vietnam in November of that year, and the size of the anti-war demonstrations that fall made it clear they could not get away with it. Mm. You know, I mean, so you know, then, so, so so you know, even when you don't think you're making a difference, maybe you are. And you know the thing is, is that um, you know uh, when, when, when frustrating times, there was this wonderful uh, little, little cartoon I saw. You know, this house is on fire, and this guy coming back with a bucket, and he said, "We tried water, but it didn't work." <laughs> you know, sometimes you need more water, or maybe you need to be a little more strategic in how you fight the fight. You know, so you know that, that and it's the same with thing with social movements. You know that you. Um, you may need greater numbers. You may need to go beyond straight demonstrations for actual, you know, nonviolent direct action to actually general strikes and try to shut, actually shut things down, I mean, occupy, you know, things like that. And it, I mean, I, it depends on the movement, depends on the country, you know, whatever. But you know, don't give up. Don't think you're, don't think you're not making a difference. Yeah, the system is screwed up. The, the, the system is not responding. But you know, you know. Uh, we, we've, uh, I mean, I mean, I mean look, 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 at, look, look at your history in terms of feudalism, in terms of the right rise of liberal democracy and of workers' rights and every, everything else. I mean, you, you had a lot of impressive struggles. You survived a freaking Nazi occupation. You know, if you can beat that, <laughs> you should be able to fight your government on these other things. <laughs> Part of this history, you know, it was not that the Danish government was over, it was uh, cooperating with the overbank power. It was a people who resisted. Yeah. I right. think, I think, it, you know, I think we should end now. Uh, and uh, I want to thank all of you for participating this Wednesday. Danish terrorists. Danish terrorists. <laughs> they, you know, there was, a, there was a movement in this country many years ago, and I did like the movement, but I liked the header slogan. It was only dead fish floating with the stream. And I think that is uh, what we should remember. I met once, many years ago, I met a guy from Amnesty International, and I said, you know, the politicians don't know what's happening. You know, we need to inform them. He said, no, no, no. They know exactly what is happening. They know exactly what happened. But they have all the provinces, and it's your job to change the provinces. And I think that should be the ending words. So thank you for... Mm -hmm.